Marty Fredrickson. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited for this. We want to know all about how to write hit songs so we can be like you. I think I know everybody here, or a lot. Do I have to explain everything? Can we just say, hey, man, great seeing you. I'll talk to you guys. I'll give you a call after. No, we won't no. do that. That sounds boring. Hey, thanks for joining me, man. Uh, this is really an uh, interesting thing to do. I'm a little nervous doing this. I used to feel nervous like this when I get into writing sessions. Now I just do writing sessions. But uh, I'm not just a songwriter. I don't claim to be the songwriter. I think I'm more of a, let's base everything I do from this point on and my whole life and career of being a collaborator. I think that's what I became. Uh, and I accept that role. And uh I really love it too. I, I'm, I haven't really sat down and wrote a song by myself in years. Just, hey, check this song out I wrote. Maybe I can, you know, come up with a couple ideas that we can make a song out of. But I, I, I prefer doing that. I, I really enjoy writing with uh, the artists, especially. I've had a little luck writing with uh, songwriters, but I've had more luck writing with the artist and kind of tailoring what they're looking for. And uh, that seemed to be my outlet to get songs uh, heard. Thank you guys. Thank you bands. Thank you artists very much. I appreciate it and always will. But uh, it's funny, you know, I talk about collaboration and it, it, it pretty much starts when I was a little, when I was five years old in the neighborhood I grew up in. Uh, my brother was four years older than me and we had, we lived in a neighborhood where it was, Partridge family across the street, uh, the Indian family down the road and another, the white band over here. And we'd walk down the street and the garage would be open and there'd be four guys playing in there. And, I, you know, I was five years old. It blew my mind. I was like, that's what I, I want to play that. I'd, I'd go home and tell my dad and my mom, we want, we want equipment. We need to do that. We'd, we'd be banging around on bongos and shit like that. But, uh, Finally, my dad came home one day and brought an amp and some drums and a, a microphone and a guitar. And we, me and my brother hit at it and uh, started back then, the collaborating, me and him just playing songs we knew or tried to at least. So uh, it's been a long way from there, but I still think of it as collaborating. And, uh, you know, maybe I came a little bit from a, a music family. My mom was a... a she sang on Mexican radio when I was before my before I was around when she was young. So she would sing the commercials, and I knew she always sang when I before I was born. Uh, in the womb, I heard her singing, and and growing up and uh, just being a, a child, she'd be singing. So then I would start doing the same thing, and I I remember one time I was probably six or seven, and. Someone told my mom, man, Martin, really, like, he really sings, doesn't he? Because I guess I'd just be back singing stuff, you know, not knowing who was over at the house. And so it always came easy and it wasn't necessary singing songs I heard. I would just make up stuff and sing stuff. And and I still do that same shit. Sometimes I'll sing someone else's song and then end up writing something that's not that, but kind of inspired from that for sure. I, I, I'll, I'll definitely admit that. But art of collaborating, it also, you know, from the early days to the instruments, to being in choir. I didn't collaborate too well when I was in choir in, in high school. Uh, I got kicked out of choir because I, th uh, I couldn't wait for everyone to learn their part. So I was like, wait, I already know that part. Wait, uh, I was making up the fifth part that didn't belong in the song and I finally got kicked out. And so collaborating in that big choir thing did not work well for me. But the band thing, it definitely does. Can everybody hear me? Thumb up. Yeah. Can you yeah. hear my guitar? Let's see if it works. Wait. Yeah. Here's a song that I didn't write. You belong among the wildflowers. You belong in a boat. Out at sea. I wish I wrote that one. I'm not going to play any more guitar, by the way. I see better guys out there that do that. There's Keith. I see him. He does that. There's Nick. He, yeah, you guys, pick up a guitar. Let's jam. 
Let's write a song. <laughs> no, man. Uh, you know, it's uh, the collaborating thing goes far and beyond just being in the room writing a song. It goes collaborating with people that uh, maybe uh, talk to people about you, like a John Greenberg. I mean, John Greenberg mentioned to a guy named Mike Inez, said, I know this guy that he could sing and that, you know, they were looking for a singer for this almost famous movie. And John Greenberg suggested me to Nancy or to Mike Inez. And he said to Nancy, Hey, there's a guy we can put on the list. And next thing you know, I'm flying out to Seattle singing in a movie called almost famous. Thank you, John Greenberg. That's a collaboration right there. So it, it it's all happened because of that. I met a guy, uh, Aaron Jacobus, back before I had really anything going. Well, I had other things going. Here's where it really started. Started as being an artist, so I understand that artist thing. I got in a band in 84. I had a record deal on Geffen Records with a band called The Drop in the Gray. And I was the drummer in the band, and I sang backgrounds, and I didn't write any songs. The, the singer was the, the machine, the, the writing machine, and I just played along and learned and uh, did a tour, and then the band broke up. That's kind of been my uh, being in a band. I I, I think uh, it's it's not as easy as it's uh, people think, and I'm sure a lot of you guys can vouch for that. It's like how do you hang in there and make a band happen? Well, I learned that it wasn't easy. My next band, I got in. Uh, I was a guitar player and a singer with another singer. Band broke up. Record was done. The band broke up before the record came out. That was, I was like, that's it, I'm done. So I started doing a lot of demos that I was doing for this band as well. But, and uh, a &R guy, Aaron Jacobus, heard some demos I was doing and said, hey, you sound really good. He passed them on to this dude named Damon Johnson from this band called Brother Kane. And uh, that was kind of my big break as far as um, being not being in a band, just this guy that uh, does good demos and could help you with a song if you got an idea so um i had a big i had a, my first big number one with damon johnson here nashville tennessee he's living along there with chuck garrett i see him there hi uh aerosmith's uh a and r person loved this song that i wrote with with brother kane it was a number one uh, rock song before active rock and all that stuff uh and he really loved the song. He goes, who wrote this song? I want to get, I want to hook this guy up and hook him up with one of my bands. And so my uh, publisher, I had a publishing deal. I'm passing a lot of stuff up, but I'll try to get to the point of things here faster than I probably will. Anyway, I got a meeting with John Kaladner and he goes, I'm, I really want you to work with this band Jackal. And I was like, man, Okay. They had a chainsaw song, and I wasn't really the, the I, don't, I didn't really think I could help this man or do, it just wasn't as, maybe as melodic as something I wanted to do, but he, I said, I agreed anyway, hey man, thank you for, you know, considering me just to get with one of your bands, and a week later, he called me personally and goes, listen, I've been thinking about it, I really don't want to get you with Jackal, and I go, oh, really, why? And he goes, because I want to get you in with Aerosmith, so... My brother Kane's song turned into getting in the room with two guys that, you know, Stephen Tyler and Joe Perry, two guys that, you know, were posters in my room. And who would ever think, why would a guy like me be in a room with these guys to help them with a song where all I'm going to do is copy their songs? Anyway, I got the opportunity and John gave me some advice there. And it was advice that if I didn't listen to him, I, would have, I wouldn't I would be talking to you guys about any of this. But uh, he said, listen, you're going to get in with those guys and they'll jam and they jam good. They'll Joe just starts playing something and Stephen will start singing anything and you'll be doing what you do. And if you don't take the reins and grab one of those ideas that you jam out and really make something out of it, you're going to come, you're going to get with them and you're going to, that's going to be it. You're not going to get anything. So that was my producer hat I put on. I, I've jammed some ideas with Joe Perry. He came in and uh, I had this, we just started playing. I, I mean, what really got me into the music business and really was my break was technology. I ended up uh, buying this, uh, thing called the Lin 9000 it was a drum machine and I was I learned it and I I was a drummer so I learned how to play this thing and and 
load in cool drum sounds and stuff. And I walked in that room with Steven and Joe with this Lynn 9000 triggering cool drum sounds and opening the hi hi hat and playing with them. And Joe's sitting there and I'm playing the pads and Steven's over here singing. And then I put a beat down and then I'd pick up the bass and play. And then I had jams. I had five different jams, like, like John Claudner said I'd have. And well, they left that night and I had one more day with them. Well, that night I, I stayed up and I, I assembled one of the ideas that I thought was really good and, and uh, strung it in and wrote a, wrote a bridge for it and just made it a, a song. It was really a, just a jam. It wasn't this finished thing by all means. It, it was like not even a lot of melodies on there. I woke up in the middle of the night with a verse melody. I put it down. I went in the next morning really early to the studio and worked on it some more and, Joe walked in, I played him what I assembled, and he goes, man, this sounds, this is, this is rocking. And I had a feeling Stephen wasn't coming in the next day. I think that he thought we didn't get anything. He thought it was a jam and they didn't get anything, so I don't think he was going to come in. He was working with Glenn Ballard at the time. This was for this uh, Nine Lives record of Aerosmith. Well, uh, Joe loved what I came up with. He goes, hey, man, get me in. Let me put some guitar down. And he put his guitar down and... and uh, he goes, and he, Stephen called while he was, after we had a few things, and he goes, man, you got to come in. This thing's a freight train. You got to come in, man. And he showed up, and I sang him my verse melody, and he loved it, and we, he put it down. He didn't have words, but we put melodies down, and we were, like, smiling, and I was asking for pictures at the end of the day, you know? Like, if I don't ever see these guys, I at least got to get a picture. How am I going to tell anyone I was working with these guys? Well, it went well. They they it stuck with them. Maybe a month later, I got a call. Joe Perry called me straight up and he goes, "Man, I really like working with you. We really love the jam that we put together, and I want you to come out to my house and and let's put some more of those together." And I did, and I ended up with like four songs on their Nine Lives record after that point, and that was the end of it. Once I was with Aerosmith, then you you know, then I had John Claudner, and then I had John Greenberg, and then I had publishers and everyone saying, hey, you got to get with this guy. He did those songs. They weren't hit songs on there, so they were rock songs that I didn't understand the difference, you know, what's what's this song to this song, but I didn't get, like, the pop song. I got a rock, a really couple good rock tracks that I was really proud of. But it opened the door, and then it came around again, the, them wanting to uh, write again for the next record and I went down and started doing it and this guy Mark Hudson was there and we ended up me and Mark got a job uh collaborating on this record Just Push Play and at that time it was from ADAT's Nine Lives Just Push Play was Pro Tools I had taken in between those years while they were touring and while I was writing with people and having all these opportunities writing with Ozzy and stuff in between there and uh that's all its own stories but from that window, I went from ADATs to Pro Tools and learned it really well. And it was the beginning of Pro Tools, you know, like really having multiple tracks and and really the changing music a bit, you know, at the beginning of that change of, wow, the music got really tight, you know. And Stephen hated it. It'd be like, I'd be fixing things. You ain't in there fixing stuff, are you? But I did. And it sounded like a modern, you know, for whatever it's worth, modern fixed, you know, record that we ended up with. And they all hate it, of course. But I ended up having my first pop song on that record and it was called Jaded. And that's another story, that song. That was that song didn't exist till the very end. You know, the label felt like they didn't have a single. And I didn't know this. I went out with Steven and I uh, went to his lake house and he was on the phone and I sat in his little living room and... And I was playing this idea. I was actually messing around with the Smashing Pumpkins, just doing that. I was doing that. I mean, jaded. Then I, then I was, then I started doing. Steve was like, "Wait, wait!" On the phone. He's on the phone for an hour. What's that? What's that? I go, man. I don't know. I'm just jamming it, and. Um, he finally got off the phone and I already had like the, a chorus pattern thing going and I had a verse melody. I kept singing over it and, and, uh, he, we, 
we ended up with that song, man. And that was, uh, that song changed my life. It opened, it got me in the room with Keith Nelson to, to be able to write a, a beautiful song with them, you know, and uh, uh, there's another story. I got a guy, you know, just all from Aerosmith. Now I'm in there. I go straight from Josh Bush play to work with Mick Jagger for his solo album, you know, from, from that's how fast it started happening. And then I'm in England doing his solo. I, did, I went to Paris. He flew me out to meet him and I got the job. And while I was, when I went back to England to work on the record with him, I'm, you know, Brian Adams calls, you got to come for a meeting, man. I just, you know, really like what you're doing. And so I meet him and then Cheryl Crow calls the next day. I really want to get with you when you get back. So I'm getting all these things. And it's like, it was so much, it was so overwhelming to, you know, what do you pick? What do you do, man? Def Leppard's calling. Everyone's calling. I, and you you don't, you're being pulled this way and you're like, what do you do? And I, you know, I ended up taking that. I ended up taking the route of, I like those bands. I like that. I wanted to give it a crack and try to do something with them, you know, whereas I would have probably, if I would have went more for newer bands, I would have, it would have been a different story, but it ended up being like, Maybe just because that's what I dig, classic rock, you know, and I still do. I mean, that's just what inspires me. I, it's hard, I find it hard to listen to a lot of the new music these days because the, still the classic rock stands up so strong, the, the sound of it, you know, the production. And it, it's really what inspired me to want to even be doing music. So uh, songwriting, producing, uh, working with bands, being a producer sometimes is not necessarily coming up with a part, but it's like just having having the other guys in the room get inspired, and, they, and then you're just kind of like, I like that. No, I don't know. Oh, I like that. That's cool. And then you're you're just kind of throwing things in a big bag, man, and and seeing what sticks. And it's not necessarily this initial idea, you know, it could be start from a drum beat. You know, I'm, I'm, when I write songs, I'm get really inspired with a music and a melody thing. I'm not necessarily sitting there, check out this lyric I got. It's not the way I do it. I prefer coming up with a melody or something with the music. And it almost sounds like I'm singing something. I'm just making up words. And then you kind of go, Hey, that sounds really cool. I don't know what you're saying, but it sounds cool. And you just, kind of fit lyrics within that. And that's kind of how I've done it. I've done it other ways where here's a lyric, write music to it. It's really not, it's not as easy as it seems that way for me. So uh, I had to take a, a water break. Sorry. I'm talking <laughs> too much, man. Well, that, that was awesome. Great story. Um, what an experience and a journey. Does anybody have any questions? Let's take a question while Marty is. Ah, that sounds way more fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Come on. Who's got? All right. Uh, Kath, Kathleen, I saw your thumbs up there. Do you have a question? Oh, Amy here. We'll go to Amy. All right. I'm asking to unmute you, Amy. Can you hear me? Yeah. Where are you calling from? Awesome. I'm from Melbourne, Australia. All right. I know. Awesome. Hi, Marty. How are you going? Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm what good. It's so great to be here. Uh, just past 10 a.m. Okay. So it's it's a good, a good time. A lot of these master classes and talks on the other side of the country, it's usually 3, 4 a.m. for me. So this is lovely. So thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks for being in musician time. <laughs> uh, thanks for being here. No, thank you. Um, quick question. Um, it seems like you... You know, you got a break and an opportunity to work with uh, some amazing musicians, and from that, it's rolled on uh, for more and more opportunities. Any advice for the unknown musician songwriter these days trying to get that opportunity, um, especially you know when I am on the other side of the country, in terms of uh, not hassling songwriters but wanting to collaborate, all that kind of stuff. Is there any kind of uh, technique or um, advice you, you for someone you, like me? Like, do you play instruments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I play guitar, I sing, and, and I songwrite. Well, that's a great place to start for yeah. sure. I mean, I would, you know, I would suggest kind of what I did even before I was uh, writing with valid artists and. I was collaborating when I had, when I got record deals, different record deals, I was collaborating, you know, we were unknown, we were nobodies, but we had high mm -hmm. hopes of being, you know, stars. And, and I never thought I would just fall into being 
this behind the scene guy and, you know, have, have a lot of luck there, but I, I really enjoy it. And, and my suggestion would be, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm really strong on collaborating. I don't know if you do that, but if I would suggest finding people that are like, are in maybe in the same position you are and collaborating and, and really trying to get something to sound cool. And, you know, I hate saying it, but it's hard to really sell a song without having something to play for someone, or at least mm -hmm. be in that club playing that song or doing what you do. And someone goes, Oh, that's really cool. That's a, that's, you know, other than that, it's so hard to, how do you get your music out there? I think if you work with two other writers, you have two more chances of getting your music exactly. out there, you know? So yeah. I would stay back to collaborating. It's always a good thing, you know? Awesome. Makes sense. Thank you very much. Yep. All right. Good question and good luck. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mitch. Hey, Mitch. Hey, the incredible Brett Lightning. Thank you, Brett. Um, wow. I'm just overwhelmed. Uh, I've, I've been telling people all week I was going to study under Marty Fredrickson this <laughs> week. And they, they all say the same thing to me. Uh, who's Marty Fredrickson? Yeah. And, and I say, no, you don't understand. Marty Fredrickson is the writer producer he's it i've been obsessed with you and your career since nine lives the the album's so nice because they had to cut it twice and it's just an amazing amazing record uh and what you did i i don't care whether they you know what joe thought about it or not but i gotta tell you just push play is a genius album and there i felt there were tracks on it that should have been massive hits beyond beautiful to this day, I can't stop singing that song. It just blows me away. Sunshine, the harmonies on it, uh, Jaded, uh, all these incredible, incredible songs you've done with Aerosmith. It just blows my mind. And it's just like you were saying a second ago, before the world degenerated into kicks and claps, we had, this is the kind of music I listen to is you. That's what I listen to. I listen to Marty Fredrickson. And uh, John Kolodner used to come to my house every week before he was an A&R. He was uh, a music columnist for a newspaper. But uh, I want to ask you, what is the process like to write these songs, with, particularly with Aerosmith? How long does it take? How do you wrangle all the pieces together and go through it and assemble it? What is it like? How long does it take? And what's involved to write these amazing and produce these amazing Aerosmith songs and records. Well, I mean, it doesn't hurt having a, you know, a guy like Joe Perry coming up with some guitar riff on Beyond Beautiful. And I, I remember it to as clear as day. And I was almost, I was just in his apartment. I was staying with Joe when we were working on that record at his house. And I was just watching TV winding down. It was kind of late at night and, Hey man, you want to feel like going to getting down in the studio and just laying some things down? It'd be ten at out ten at night, you know. And I go, yeah, of course. I don't. Wanna, I'm not going to say no. The only reason I'm at his house is so I can do that. I'll do whatever. I could sleep. I'll sleep when I'm dead. So I'd take that shot and we'd go down there and man, we'd build. He'd do stomps and loops. I remember on that song, we we he had this riff and. We just built the track, and I, I tell you, man, that song. Two hours after we we built these loops, it, it was like a time of loops, CDs, and stuff. So you find a cool loop that felt cool to play a guitar to. So we'd do that, and then he'd start. We'd start building our own sounds, and we had that track kind of done that night, fully everything, all the music. And had a few melodies, but uh, played it for Steven. And I remember from there, I went to his house and then I worked on melodies with him on it and, and we had this track already. It was, it's uh there's a lot of interesting stories with Aerosmith and that record was, uh, you know, it was four guys in the room pretty much writing the record. It was me, Mark Hudson, Joe Perry and Steven. And it was a long process and it was a lot of things going on on those songs, a lot of overdubs and a lot of tracks. And I think that's why they don't like it, you know, Steven, he'll go crazy. And Mark Hudson, man, when he starts doing vocals, he, you know, he'll put 50 vocal backgrounds on there. Even if you don't, can't really hear it, they're there. And, you know, the record ended up being a real experiment in a, in a sense. I love the record too. I think some songs could, could be stronger. If I could rewrite them right now, 
I, I can definitely fix a couple of them, but that ain't going to happen. Wow. Well, I don't know. I mean, to me, these are perfect. I would be fascinated how you could make them even better than they were because they're, they're incredible songs. And, and uh, the stuff on Nine Lives, it, it, it just all the music, the chords, the melodies, the sections of these songs, it's just that album particularly I'm obsessed with. It just blows my mind completely apart. And anything else you can tell us about the process of, of writing that? Uh, I mean, Nine Lives, I'll tell you exactly how we wrote that song. I was in Miami and uh, we, we, me, Joe and Steven were in this little setup like what I'm in right now, just, you know, very minimal. And we started jamming a whole lot of Rosie by ACDC. And then the next thing you know, it turned into this song called Nine Lives. And that's how that one came. You know, I don't even know if it sounds like you might have the up ness of that, you know, but that's how that came. And you know, I, I didn't I thought it was kind of like a Judas Priest kind of song. I was like, oh, they're never going to use this. But they did. I think when Stephen gets on it, it definitely doesn't sound like Judas Priest. Well, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Marty. And just let's, thank you. let's keep doing music at your level. I want to hear more of it. All right, man. Well, I want to, hey, like I said, I see a lot of faces. Shout out to to Keith. Shout out to Nick. Shout out to Chuck. My, Are you in Nashville, Chuck? Thumbs up. Yeah. Are you right down the street from me? Here, let's go to Chuck anyhow, because he has a question. Hi, Chuck. Hey, man. Yeah, I can, if I was better at it, I could wing a pick and hit your house right now. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, Marty, I've known you for so many years, man. I never get tired of the stories. And it's uh, I just um, I'm just so proud to be your friend. And um, and I'm so proud of you, you know, professionally, too, as well. And, uh, you know, I look up to you. I've been obviously we've all been, you know, quarantined and sitting here and, and I've been writing a ton. And every time I write a song, I'm always thinking, shit, man, I got to I'm going to call Marty and see what he would do with this, you know, or whatever. I'm always thinking about you. And I'm always thinking, well, the only if. I wonder what Marty would do if he could write a real chorus or something. You know? <laughs> so I'm always thinking about you and I want to pass stuff on. And one of the reasons why I got on this too was, uh, you know, just to see your face, but also, you know, it comes to people like Amy and Keith, uh, Nick and Tuck, everybody here. I mean, we should all communicate and collaborate with each other, you know, and, and songwrite. Why not? You know, we're, we're kind of just stuck here. I know we're all doing the same things. You know, I'm, I'm saying I'm a bass player and I'm learning pentatonic blues riffs on my guitar just to become a better guitar player and a better songwriter and and uh, all that so if you guys want to collaborate i'm always here um well, this, this definitely this could definitely work i've been doing a bit of it you know yeah. because of everything we're going through and uh yeah. but i had a question for you regarding yeah, like, go. collaborating with people and, and basically you know, I'm not much of a lyricist unless it's it's my own tune or something, and I'm real. It's something personal to me. I I can come up with lyrics. I'm you know I'm blessed to have like my wife, who's an amazing wordsmith and an amazing poet and lyricist. But uh, when you're co-writing with somebody else, and uh, it seems to me like the lyrics sometimes have a tendency to halt the session at times. Um, with the music seems to flow because it's easier to kind of communicate that. But how do you deal with lyrics and writing lyrics with another artist if uh you know you're just if you're just kind of feeling they're not working or it's just not you know uh some you're stuck here do you guys collaborate together on lyrics or do you have somebody you go to to kind of sharpen it up i mean lyrics are the beast you know that's usually for me uh, uh, the song the melody and the music comes pretty quick like yeah. for for especially for most of the hits i've had and uh, the lyrics, some of them came quick, but for the most part, they were more, you know, sitting around and, and shedding, just going back and forth and to come maybe come back to it the next day. And, you know, like with Stephen on Jaded, he had five verses. All I had to do was edit it. I said, I like this verse better than that one, or maybe pull two lines from that. That was easy, man. He He killed that. But it just depends. Some guys like, you know, are really great with lyrics and, and it's not as difficult, but if you're starting stuff from scratch, just coming up with a concept is, uh, you know, could be tough. I mean, being, I'm in Nashville and I really, I'm not here to write country songs and I don't want to be known to write country songs. So I don't write country songs, but they, they write lyrics before they even have a music and melody, you know, for the most part, well, we'll, we'll get those four chords later. 
That's why they all sound the same. So it's just so uncreative to me. I mean, I love great lyrics, but I prefer, I, I love great lyrics over uh, great music that's a little risky somewhat, you know? Yeah, so just as much time as you spend, you know, on that drum beat and, you know, on the music and tuning the guitar and all these different parts, you you, you save a couple of days just to sit there with the pen and paper and just start throwing ideas. Sometimes, but not when you're working with a guy like Tuck Smith, man. It just we just <laughs> we just roll and go, man. You know, and I love even, it. Even with Keith with Buck Cherry, man. I mean, Josh was pretty quick on the pen. You know, he kind of had a in, and and I always let I always leave that open, man. I will only suggest if need be. You know, I'm hoping okay. I'm with a band that. I mean, I'll give you a story with Keith. Uh, him, he, him, and Josh walked in, and the first thing they played me, they played me this song that no one heard yet. It was a demo and it was called crazy bitch. And they, you know, they were playing me these songs that go, Hey, what would you do if you were to do something different? And I heard, I heard that song. I go, I would just get a really good recording of that and put that one out. I remember not even, it was really the first song he played. Then he played me this other idea. It was a ballad and sorry. And it was already this Josh had the first lyrics I mean, I think I, I, I think I just tweaked the chorus and I added probably more chords than it should have ended up with, but it ended up having like 10 chords instead of the four they had already. <laughs> but, uh, and just like, that was, I almost felt like a song doctor coming in on that song and Hey, what, who, what if we did a bridge here and, you know, a little intro. And so they kind of walked in with a gift on that and, you know, but that doesn't always happen. Most of the time it's something from scratch. You know, I do love someone bringing in an idea, you know, it's, and especially if they're digging it, because they're the ones that got to go out there and sell it, you know. Awesome. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm going to pass it to um, to Gonzalo. Hi, Gonzalo. Hey. Where are you coming from? I'm Hi. in Australia. I'm originally from Peru. Uh, nice to talk to you, Marty. It's been amazing. I've been following your career, especially with Aerosmith for so long, and I'm so impressed. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, over the years, I've become kind of interested in their unreleased work. So I was wondering if you have any favorite songs that you've written with Aerosmith that didn't make the cut. Uh, I found some titles on the internet, Aiding True, Bridges Are Burning, Easy, I Love You Down, Innocent Man. Uh, are these some songs that you think are, were strong enough in, in the time of when you were writing it? Um, I mean... Yeah, listen, that's another, that's that collaborating word coming back into where you write these songs, you give them to the record company, to the A&R guy, and they go, not, not quite this song. Uh, you know, they, it's, it could be the best song in the world. And if that guy is just in a different mood and just doesn't feel like that's right on the record, then it, it can be shut down that simple. And Innocent Man, that song is, I mean, we have a full on, you know it's probably out there now but we have a real full-on production of that just like that record you know strings and all those backgrounds and all everything you and and the same with the other ones you named there's like some of them are like done yeah i you know? uh, i had the chance to ask a similar question to tom hamilton the other day he mentioned that the band was starting to work on a box set so uh, are you are you involved in the process? Would you maybe push and say, "Hey, why don't you put you know innocent man there?" Or I, I'm sure song? that I'm sure that they're probably talking about a lot of those songs. That seems like the most logical place to start, at least, of unreleased stuff that does sound really good. And you know, these guys are getting older now, I and mean, I'm sure they can whip out a couple of cool jams. But uh, there was a lot of heart and time put into those. So to get to do something from scratch to to compete with that kind of sound or whatever you call it, it would be a lot of work, you know, and I don't know if they want to, you know, go there. I would love to get with them again and try a song or two for sure. You know, I, I still work with Steven a bit and I miss working with Joe Perry. I mean, Joe Perry is the reason that I got in with Aerosmith too. He took, he took me under his wing and he liked where I came from. I was his, I was his bass player, drummer, uh, singer, and he is a guitar player, and he plays shit, and I just start throwing out stuff, and that's it worked, you know. You mentioned final question, sorry. Uh, you mentioned working with Joe Perry and coming up with a few initial jams in '86, and then you built a demo on top of those. Did those 
eventually turn into a final songs? Yeah, I mean, there's so from that as as well as that session. I had four songs on that record. I probably wrote uh, for that record. I think I wrote nine or ten songs, and they're all demoed. And they all you can. Some of them don't have quite finished lyrics, but one of those songs from that Nine Lives was a song we ended up. It we finished it and we wrote we rewrote the words uh, for this Charlie's Angels, the first movie that came out. There was a little piece in there. But that was from the Nine Lives experience. Thank you, man. Yeah, Did man. Did you write a song called Loretta with them? No, I might be Mark. I mean, they've you know they've collaborated with so many people. I'm just I'm just honored and grateful that I was able to do what I did with them. I mean, at the end of the day, I probably wrote 40 songs with those guys, you know, and probably had 25 of them on record. So, you know, I'm grateful. Yeah. Well, can't get enough of that, man. I, I hope that they get released. I hope that you keep writing with them. Thank you for your time. It's been amazing talking to you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Let's turn it over to Dividing Face. Uh, I'm asking to unmute you guys. You see that little pop up on your screen? Oh, did they just disappear? Okay. Maybe they had a bad connection. Let's turn it over to Keith. Uh, Keith. Hi, Keith. Marty. Good to hey, see you, man. Good to see you. You look healthy, screen. buddy. <laughs> you do. Hey, so first and foremost, the reason that I'm here is the reason that I wanted to write with you in the first place is because I'm a fan. So nothing but love and appreciation for what you do. I am the geek that would read the liner notes on every record. And when I saw your name, I was like, that's a dude I got to fuck with. And so we tried for years to get a hold of you. And we finally got a hold of you. Just like you said, um, Marty heard a song that was probably our biggest hit. And you could have said, oh yeah, well, let me, let me get in there. Let me get my third, but you didn't. You were like, yeah, you just need to record that thing. So I will always appreciate you for that, man. Amongst many other things. We've written a lot of songs together and I don't think a lot of people understand um, your mastery. I can only say this because I've been in a room with you and I've said this to you in, in person. You could take a Chinese menu and go, you know, Kung Pao chicken, egg food, young, and it's a hit. Because when, <laughs> when it comes out of your mouth, you have this way of just speaking the language of rock and roll. And that's really, really a gift. And, and I think that's been, in my opinion, one of the reasons you've been able to slip into, because you're a band guy too, you slip into the band and you just assimilate and become another member. Like you were another member of Buck Cherry when we made all those records together. Yeah. And and it was very natural. So that all those processes with you inspired the way I try to write now. Um, I've written with Nick and I've written with Tuck. And, you know, I remember walking in with you and having a session. It started at noon. We walked out at 3.30. We had a finished song. We had guitar parts, harmonies, 99% of the lyrics. I mean, it was like speed dating rock and roll. But it wasn't crap it was really good stuff stuff that made it to record stuff mm -hmm. that won an ASCAP award for being spun on the radio so yeah um, but here, here's my question um, I learned more about you in the last 45 minutes than I learned in all of our sessions together because we never got a chance to talk shop like this we were always we always had a job to do so when you get with an artist do you like to prepare it's a two-part question. Do you like to prepare or do you like to walk in blank and just counterpunch? And when you do prepare, what does that look like prior to? Listen, man, that's the, that's a really great question. And I'm glad you asked because it was something I was talking about earlier. And uh, I used to really put a lot of pressure on myself as a songwriter and getting these opportunities to get in rooms with these artists, you know, and going, man, I got to come back. I can't, I got to have something. I got to, you know, I remember pounding myself to try to write Aussie ideas and I'm just not that Aussie guitar player, but I, I, what I am is I'm the, I'm the Aussie. I could sing those melodies for sure, but I pounded myself with all these different ideas and, and, uh, you know, I got with him and I got with the the songs I ended up with were just songs that just didn't exist. They just were coming up with them on the spot. And I got to be honest with you, minus like, sorry, and even next to you that we did, you guys already had these starts. But for the most part, every song I've 
uh, participated in and had a hit with, I didn't even have an idea. I walked into the session and I, I just took that pressure off myself. I go, you know what, man, I'm better at just being in the room and talking with the artists and going, man, you heard that song or, you know, remember that Bob Seger song or whatever. And you just start jamming. And the next thing you know, you're just singing this whole other thing. And then, then it just comes. And that's, that's, the, I don't even pressure myself unless something comes up. I'm not really putting that for It's, it's just too much, man. It's, it's, it's not even worth it. It's not fun. And so now when I do, and, and it's been like this, even with you guys, I didn't say, hey, well, I, don't worry about those songs. Let me play you this idea. I didn't do that when we got together. I didn't play shit. You guys came in. I'm like, this is cool shit. Let's, this, this is something you guys love. I want to fucking get if I can help make it better. I'll make it better. And that was a gift from you guys to me. And I, I and I accept that. And I'm grateful for that. And, you know, I've keep, I've given a lot of gifts to other people, too, just by singing a, a melody. I got with this guy, Gavin Rosdale, and he walked in and we, you know, you shoot the shit, you shoot the shit. And just, I don't know this guy. It's a date, man. And, you know, he's this guy that everyone knows. And I'm this guy that he don't know and no one knows. But John Kalodner, you need to get with Marty. And and Irving sent this guy over. And I was it's talking great about invitation. Yeah, I was talking of I uh, was just playing some song that was kind of working at the time and started strumming it and and then I started singing something and he was he started, he took his pad out and started writing and, and I kept going I just kept singing and working on the next section and I ended up writing the melody and music for this song that we ended up with and he wrote the lyrics while I was figuring out the music he's like yeah that's really good that's really good and he'd write. And I'm singing the pre-chorus now. Yeah, I really like that. And then I broke into the chorus. And these are, I'm singing bullshit. I got out in the world that I did. Uh, I'm not singing nothing. And he, he goes, hey, I think I got it, man. Let's put this down. I put it, two acoustics down. And he goes, hey, can we add a bass synth on the chorus? I go, yeah. He went in there. He didn't even show me the lyrics. He went in there and sang this song. And he left. And he was there a little over two hours at my house. And that's one of the biggest songs I've uh, wrote and it was one of the best and easiest, you know, and it was that not having an idea. I didn't have nothing, man. I, I just, I just, that preparing, I know, I know that you've been doing a lot of songwriting now and, you know, you get with a guy like Tuck, man, you got, he's got such a great attitude of just wanting to write something cool and classic and stuff, you're going to get something, man. Cause his attitude's right. You know, like he wants it, man. And I think, I think that's enough energy and I want it. I want to get something great for him too. I think that energy is enough and it, it's, it's way more rewarding, you know, to know that, wow, man, we didn't, that was a, that didn't exist before we got together. And that's, yeah. that's yeah. to me, that's worth it that's why I still do it. And that's why I enjoy doing it. I'd rather just stick with that. And if it's going to be, I didn't get into music in the first place for it to be so like nerve wracking and shit. I just wanted to be in a band and fucking play music. You know, I didn't even think production and songwriting. And this. I was just wanting to play the drums. Thanks man. And yeah. it's great. It's great to see you. Next Great time I'm in Nashville. We, we gotta definitely get on a Zoom, man, and and knock out some stuff for sure. There's a lot of cool Let's do things it. happening. Yeah, I'd love to, man. All right, awesome. Great questions. Um, all right, I'm gonna go back to dividing face here. Hi guys, how you doing? Hey, good. Marty, thanks for uh hosting this. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you good. All right. So we're at Dividing Face from Virginia, modern rock band. Um, couple questions. Um are you, I know you said you're working with, uh, you prefer to work with more classic rock uh, type of bands. Are there any modern rock bands that you currently work with? Um, second question is, um, how has songwriting changed today versus when you're working in the 90s and the 2000s and today, of course? And, um, and third, um, how important is additional production on top of just the basic bass, guitars, drums, vocals? You know, how, how important is that to a song and how much can it take it to a next level to make it radio friendly? I think, uh, you know, I think a lot of uh, when you go to classic rock, I think I'm just inspired by classic rock, but I've definitely worked with some modern bands and and still am working with, you know, 
different approaches. And I, I really do try to capture what the band is as far as uh, it, it, there's four guys in the band. And well, the main thing is let's make sure those four instruments are working first. And then if we want to put a little color on it, that's not so, you know, necessary, but makes it more modern or, you know, I think the production is important of today's music to make it sound like today. It doesn't mean the song sounds like today. You know, I think you can get away with more today with the lyrics and people don't care if you, you know, cuss and say it doesn't even, it's not even, no one even thinks about it anymore. So um, definitely though, modern music, I think just stick to what you guys could actually pull off live. I know there's a lot of music out and when people play live these days, there's not a lot of playing going on. You know, there's a lot of tracks and I mean, that's cool and it works and it works big time and it's very consistent, but it's not to, for me. I'm just, I just call me old. It's just not fun to me. I, I, I like, I like hearing a little bit of that. I like the real. Currently music. don't use tracks yet live. So we're, we're the same way. Yep. Oh man. All right. Thanks guys. Um, I'm going to turn it over to John Klein. Are you there, John? I see your computer screen, but. Uh, <laughs> asking to unmute you. I don't know if you can. Okay, well, I'll, I can come back to you too. All right, let's turn it to um, Sierra. Hi, Sierra. How Hi. you doing? Good, thank you. How are you? Good. Good. Hi, Marty. Thank you so Hi. much for doing this. Um, I'm 15. I'm a songwriter. And if there's any person's career who I would really want to have when I'm older, it would definitely be yours. I definitely really look up to you and I love all, pretty much all the songs that you've written but um my question actually has to do with Ozzy because I'm a big Ozzy fan and my favorite song by him is Dreamer so I was just wondering if you had any stories from whenever you were writing that or how that came to be yeah that's uh there's a real good story with that song and I'm gonna try to say it as quick as possible but uh Ozzy's definitely a character and a great guy and he's got a great heart but uh I was supposed to get with Ozzy. My publisher was trying to hook me up with him. And so finally I got a date on the calendar and okay, he was supposed to be here and it's an hour before he arrived. And I got a phone call. Hey, Monty, this is Bob. Uh, I'm afraid to tell you, Ozzy's not going to be able to make it today. We're going to have to reschedule. And I go, oh, you know, and this is, remember, this is my stress of yeah. preparing and having these five ideas I was going to play to him, you know, and knocking myself out late hours and, so I was like, oh, relief, kind of, but dang, man, now what do I do? Now I'm like stressing until the next time. So we rescheduled. His Bob, the same thing, He was uh, 15 minutes before he's supposed to be there, Bob calls his mom, I'm sorry, Ozzy's got a parent-teacher's conference he just cannot get out of. And I'm like, oh, man. So that didn't happen. And I, th and I think that was it, two cancellations. And we said, we'll reschedule, we'll reschedule. And then a guy that John Kalana hooked me up with, this guy named Mick Jones. I know you all know who he is. He, he wrote all the Foreigner songs. And uh, Mick calls me and goes, hey, Monty, you want uh, you want to join me on a right? And I, I go, yeah, what are you doing? Well, I'm coming to L.A. in, in three days. And I uh, wanted to see if you'd write with me with for Ozzy. I'm like, you're kidding, Really? I go, it's so crazy because I've been supposed to be getting with him and he just blew me off every time. And I'm like, of course I would do it, man. So I get with Mick. We're at the Sunset Marquee. And uh, Ozzy was late. I'm like, shit, he's going to blow it off, man. I, you know, because I was in close with Mick. We were like, we had some uh, a song in a movie that did really well, you know. And and I just hit it off with him. He was like, you know, my old, old bandmate, man. I'm just... Thank you, John, for introducing me to that fantastic man, Mick Jones. But anyway, Ozzy finally did show up. And I, I'm pretty sure that's the first song we wrote. He was like, you know, I met him and, you know, yeah, I'm sorry. I was supposed to get with you and we didn't. And well, we'll do it now. So he says, what Ozzy needs, Ozzy needs an imagine. And I'm like, looking at Mick and I'm like, he's Ozzy, right? Yes, yeah, so Ozzy needs that type of song, and so we were in this. We were in the Sunset Marquee. There's a studio down in the basement. We were in Mick's room at the time because he had a keyboard up there, and that's when he was saying, "I need Ozzy needs this." And imagine, so Mick started playing some foreigner chords, man. You know, just simple, 
simple shit that Mick does, you know. And then. Uh, and then all of, I, I don't even remember who came up with the title Dreamer, but it, it might have been Ozzy. It, but uh, Mick had this little pattern. I started singing this kind of verse melody. Da, 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 da. And uh, listen, we ended up with this beautiful song that I'm so proud to be a part of, uh, thanks to those guys. I mean, talk about another gift, uh, being in the room with two amazing songwriter legend guys that just, you know, if they weren't around, I would have never done, even wanted to do music. But to have to have that opportunity, I mean, I can't, you know, I can't even tell you how. And, you know, you're saying, how do you get in? And what's, how do you get in with this person? It's like, man, tell me about it. How do you get in with it? It's a lot of, it's a lot of steps and it's a lot of people that you got to thank. And the list just is endless. You know, I could be on here thanking everyone that it took for me to get in that room with Mick Jones and Ozzy. Yeah, Kalander got me in, but the people before that, they got me to Kalander. That, that, how did that lead to that? It, it's, it's endless. So it is a lot of, uh, it's collaborating and it's don't ever don't ever not do it if you think ah what am i going to get out of this you just never know sometimes you get with someone and they'll surprise you and you get like one of the best songs you ever wrote and they're nobodies so just be open be open and be ready great thank you so much thank you thank you thanks sierra all right let's see who do we have next um oh john greenberg Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> hey, hey. Hi, nice uh, to be in here. Uh, I know a few people on this screen. Like David Fishoff right there. Yeah. There's Koofy. Talk, Nick, Keith, Carrie. I see a photo of Carrie. Hey, guys, Um, I had a question for Marty. I've known Marty since he, uh, actually, we might have met, I don't know, maybe through Kaladner. I don't remember how. I think he told me about Marty. Aaron Jacobas, maybe, but we met somewhere. I think Marty was working on. I think John Kalodner, man. I think yeah. he hooked us up as well. It's like crazy the chain, you know. Yeah, and then and then Marty hooked me up with this guy named Stephen, who uh, I thank him for, even though it was uh, it was an interesting year of my life managing Mr. Tyler. But um, sleepless can, nights. It's, it's, yeah, many a sleepless nights. There's, there's a whole other Zoom call about that later. Um, but I, I wanted to know because Marty goes back to recording. <clears throat> like the early Jason Bonham record when it was called something else. I believe he did it on ADATS. Is that right, Marty? That's exactly right, John. I think that's what you, I think when you finally did call me, you said, Hey man, I just wanted to ask you a question. I heard this Jason Bonham record and it sounds so good. I mean, how did, you, where did you do that? And I go, oh, I, you know, most of it I just did it at my house and I mixed it on a Mackie and, you know, I mixed it with what I had. Yeah. I, I had then, that was the, that was the conversation. That was kind of the first time we met with that. that conversation. So, so, so it leads to this question, right? With with all the new technology out there, and people like Nick and Tuck and Keith and and Koofy and everybody recording on various forms now, whether they're digital, or whether it's analog. Do you feel that anything recorded in any format is easy enough to put out these days? And and do you really need a label anymore or a lot of your clients coming to you like Orianthi, you just did a record with Ori, I believe. And she didn't have, she didn't have a label. So for these artists and songwriters out there, in your opinion, how important is it to have a label? And the second part is how important is it to keep your publishing versus taking the cash? Well, these days the, the cash is, is very thin you know, and a lot on a lot of these projects, especially the stuff I do. But if you want to call it rock, you know, a lot of people, just people don't want to, don't really have the funds to make it. Because I think right now the most important thing with music or new music, and if you're going to get involved with like an Orianti, for instance, I, I made a deal with her. I said, listen, if you want to do a, get together, we wrote one song and she really liked it. She goes, I really want you to do my record, but she didn't have a deal. She really had nothing. She had a manager. So I got on with her manager and we we said, decided, why don't you guys just make a record full on? You're, you guys do it. Even if you have other writers, you guys do it. 
finish it and you both owned it. So I ended up doing a record with her and we both own the record and we just got a record label for it and we did a license deal with it. So with that being said, I think the tough thing about just songwriting these days is the, the payment on songwriting is does not really pay, you know? So it's hard. It's hard when someone comes to me and goes, hey, you want to write with this thing? I'm like, I almost, I'm at the point right now where I almost have to be part of the production or somewhat of a master because it seems to be the only thing making money in streaming, you know, like they, people yeah. say, the labels are making all the money. They own the master. You know, they pay the artist 15%. And the, and from the 15%, the artist is paying a producer and, and a mixer. And they got 10% left. And the, and the labels got all 85%. And it's just, it's, I think, yeah, if you're going to do rock and if you want to have fun doing it and you you could get a major label i just think you need to have someone that's willing and daring i think or then you're just going to get that same stuff i think it the proof's out there if you look at active rock it still exists but it's not there's not the spin number that you know for rock here you get all these spins it's very low now you know and i don't know but what the answer is but it's better for the Artists to keep their masters, you think, and keep their publishing and look for opportunities with synchronization and own both sides of it instead of giving it up and taking an advance? Or do you think take the advance and roll on to the next one? What do you think they should do? Well, you got guys, This, for instance, I'll give you a big for instance. You got a guy like Ed Sheeran, right? He, I think he probably did. He's probably in that window of 360 deal, I would think, you know, yeah. of how things are going when he signed and shit. So I think he, I heard that he's retired because he has such a bad deal. That's because the label, he's got a billion spins on this and billion on that. I, and I heard he's done like, cause his deals, a 360 deal. Not only does he have to give a piece when he plays a show and, and I get it, you know, and he's probably got a castle where he lives in too, but it's just, sometimes it's just hard knowing that can't you just renegotiate with me and we'll all be happy. I would think when you get to that level, Yes, do that. And I think having a major label of what he did probably got him to that level. It's hard to do it yourself. That's less collaborating, isn't it? You yeah. know, the more collaborators you have uh, with with a product, the more chances you have. It, it comes in the weirdest places. It could be this one dude that's like, hey, man, I spun your song and it's getting really, you know, and that's thanks to that guy. Where'd he come from? Right. I mean, but you have an artist like Daughtry that you've worked with who I don't think is signed to a major anymore. And you would, would you recommend that Chris Daughtry just keeps his masters at this point and does it on his own? I mean, it's the same thing. I, you know, I'm doing that with Scott Stevens. We did a deal that we actually partake in a piece of the master because Chris owns the master and he did a, a license deal. So we did, and he pays, he's paying us well too. That's a rare one, you know, but Right. And it's, it, it's, it's in a point where it's, he wants to kind of be rock, but you know, I don't know if people are going to, he's got a rock voice. I just think that he's, he didn't establish that enough to, to pull it off. So we're, we ended up with some songs on this that are, could definitely be Daughtry thing. But I think at the end of the day, yes, he owns it. We put out a song. It was a cover song. We put it out at Christmas. It, it got it downloads. It's already recouped. We've already all made money on it, believe it or not. Right. And, but Daughtry's got to, you know, people know who he is. That's, that's hard for a new band to, how do you find out who this, how do you get to that? He's lucky. He could do it now. He's got enough base. He could work it. You know what I mean? It's yep. kind of running itself a bit. He's got great management. He's just got, you know, he's got, he's got a lot of people out there working for him. Thank you very much. All right. Good questions, John. Um, okay, I'm going to read Jonathan Klein's question. He typed it in here. Um, first of all, he says, can we do this again tomorrow? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he wants to know if you could tell us about Cry and also Sarah Evans is Stronger. Oh, well, Stronger I didn't write, but Cry I didn't write either. But what I did with Cry is, I'll tell you, I'll give you a quick story. I did produce that song and they came to me. This is after Jaded, another one of those you know, what the trickle of having a hit song, my first pop hit song. Then everyone wants you to work. Hey, Faith Hill wants you to do produce this song for you. And she wants Steven Tyler to guest on it. Ever That was my question. That was my 
thing from everybody. And can you get Steven on it too to do a, a duet? And I'm like, man, it's like I got a song I'll break away from. I can't do everything with Steven. And, and Steven, guess what? You want to do, you know. So I ended up telling Faith and them, I go, listen, why don't you just, the song's so good. And why don't you just have her just sing it? And I'd be more into producing it if it's just her. I just think I was going to Steven with, hey, Johnny Lang, you think you can get Steven to play harmonica on it? Everybody, you know. And, yeah, it's a good idea, but it wasn't really, like, changing their lives with Steven on it. It's great to have him on there, but, you know, unless he played, like, this huge part on it, if he was just going to sing on Cry, it would have probably been backgrounds. You know, hey, Steven's saying backgrounds on it. It wouldn't have made the song bigger than it is. So that I talked them out of getting Steven on that. So, uh, and that was, I didn't write that song. That was a song that they hired me just to produce. And it took me a long time to do it. It, it was one of those I lost sleep on. I was fighting and going in circles. I, I went in the studio with her in New York and I cut her, vo I went in to cut her vocal and I had like MIDI tracks because I wasn't sure what, of the key that she could sing. The song was written by a guy and, uh, the verses were very low and the chorus was really high. Well, when I got her singing, sounding good in the verse, when the chorus came, she couldn't hit the note. Then I lowered it too much. She didn't sound good in the verse. So she was like, Marty, I just don't, I don't want to do this song. I'm like, oh shit, man. They flew me out to New York. I can't, I can't go home not doing this song. I go, come on, man. You're, you're going to, you're going to get this song. We're going to work it. We're gonna, you're going to get a Grammy for this song. I know it. You're going to get a performance Grammy song. You know, I'm trying to be the psychologist producer guy. I can't leave New York. So she goes, okay, then I'll, I'll, I'll keep going, but I'm going to need a little crown and Coke. And so we got her crown and Coke, man. She loosened up and I got a really good start on that vocal, 60% of it. I knew I had something that was working and I ended up going back to Nashville and finishing it off. And she got a Grammy vocal performance for that song. Amazing. Uh, Jonathan saying it's like the Mona Lisa. I guess like, yeah. All right. Yeah, it is, man. Sometimes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Okay. Marty, it's been amazing. You know, and I know we've got a couple more questions, but can you tell, uh, people always ask me all day, how do I get a song to an artist? How do I get a song to a producer? My um, response has always been, Go look on Billboard, see who produces the artist, Federal Express the song, and uh, put something in there to make it different, that they'll remember you. Um, that, like Chef Gordon said yesterday, uh, it was so amazing. He, he Everyone kept saying, how do I work for this person? How do I get here? And he said, make yourself known, you know? Like, do something that, that like, just send a resume in. Send a cookie. Send something that they'll remember you by. I'm a songwriter. I'm Sierra. I wrote a great song for an artist. What's the best way to get that song to an artist? Man, that's the toughest question ever because there's there's really no answer to it because it, it could come from the stupidest way to to the way of just going through the machine. You know, I was watching that Clive Davis uh, documentary and older footage of him and you see his desk and it's just fucking stacks of cassettes and cds and shit just all over it it's like where did he find the time to do that and then you talk today you're going to fedex someone something today what are you going to fedex fedex them you know you'd be better off just fed fedexing them the cookie because the song it's like they're even going to have a cd player to play it on so uh, i mean it's such a today's so different I, you know i, I i'm you know, fortunately, I could tell you that that's not my forte of song placement and how to do that. So I can't really give you the, uh, uh, I can't really give you an answer on that. It's like, I'm not that guy. Like the guy that would be able to answer that more would be a John Greenberg. Cause he's like, he's great on the phone and he knows a bunch of people and he'll say, Hey man, I heard this cool song. You just got to hear it. That's how you get it. You need, you need those guys. I mean, I could say that, but I'm not known as, Hey, the song discoverer. I'm just not that guy. I, I'd rather just start something new and, you know, take it from where I'm at. So, but for me, it did happen. How the, I, it happened from a demo tape, you know, that someone get, uh, uh, but a guy personally, a, a John Greenberg, a drummer guy gave it to this A&R guy and he heard it and he goes, 
this is really good. What is this, man? I could use this guy uh, to sing in this band called Brother Kane. They didn't even have their name yet, but he wanted me to be the singer in the band because he heard this demo. And I met with him. I go, man, I don't, I'm kind of like, I did two record deals already and nothing's happening. I'm kind of in this groove of, I just want to write songs and do demos and make music myself and work with people. So, but I'd be into working with the artists. He played me some songs and that was Damon. And he, I, he wasn't really a singer. He was a guitar player. And I go, man, he sounds okay on this stuff. Let me just get with him and write a couple of songs and see what we get. And we wrote a couple of songs and that was my first production job. And my first big collaborating songwriter guy I was a songwriter producer on the first brother Kane album. And I had a number one song and then I had another single on that record and that's how it happened for me. They did have it from a demo tape. That's a hard one these days, the demo tape, you know, has to be that, has to be that guy saying, hey, just listen to this. Well, you, you know, know, Celine Dion, I was on, I was watching Good Morning America one morning. It was a, a young lady, they interviewed her and she said she sent the song to the producer. They listened to it in the car. They get so many songs and they loved it. And they decided they're going to record it. But then they called her up and they said, hey, do you have anything more? And she said, "Yeah, I got a hundred songs, but uh, so send us some more." And they re they took two of her songs on the on the album. So I, you know, I, I think like you said, there there's there's no specific way, but trying to track down a producer is that is that a great way? A manager? Um, uh, of course, I mean producers are right there. They're in the making. They know what they got. They know what they need. If there's songs to be needed, they're man, they're they're a great outlet. I mean, I would. I would trust John coming to me if I told him, man, we're like two songs short. And he says, well, let me, let me put the word out and see what we could find. And if he, you know, if he brought something that he thought could work, I would listen to it, you know, and if it worked, I would use it. So it's, it's still going to happen. It will happen that way, but you do need to know if you, you just gotta, I, I mean, the best thing is you don't give up because the right person hasn't, got your song to the right person don't give up because you it could happen in a wackier way than someone doing that who knows what about song pluggers do you believe them i do I, that's a big thing in nashville that's all they yeah. do out here it's all about song plugging so i mean if you you know but you got to write shitty country songs you know right and, and their clubs where right people show up to clubs in nashville and they just perform all day at the, at the, the yeah, you, you'll hear songs. I mean, if you want, you don't have to be in those clubs singing country songs either. You can get on your acoustic and sing a rock song, you know, or a pop song. Yeah. And you can get them heard that way. And those there's right now, there's no one out there right. you're going to play to, but you know, it'll be back. And Nashville is a good place for that. But I'll tell you one thing, you, everyone and their brothers doing that same thing. So it's just, you know, it's very congested with that concept, you know. You know, what I've been hearing every night is passion. Don't give up. None of these artists have given up. It doesn't happen overnight. There's no overnight successes. You just have to have a lot of passion and persistence, you know, it's like perseverance to keep Man, going. It's, yeah, giving up, that's like, you know, giving up on even anything, whether it's songwriting or the music business or anything you're doing. I just, I'm not quite getting it. I just can't sell this house. You don't give up, you know, you, if you want to sell houses and you want to sell expensive houses, you fucking bust your ass and you just keep cracking. And you maybe you sell a single Y one day and then 10 years later, you're selling million dollar homes. I mean, that's just, yeah, I'm 58 and I'm still writing songs and I love it, you know, and I'm up against all this great talent, man. Young 22 year old guys just killing it, man. No one even has to play anything anymore. You buy a, you buy a plug and it plays all your guitar parts and it's great. But I, one thing I feel good about is you still need something else. You still need that thing singing the melody over whatever this production is. You need that thing that, I'll make tracks, you know, I was a, tr I'm considered a track guy. That's how I got into this, you know, building tracks. It started with the Aerosmith and Brother Kane. I, I was the guy putting the track there. Like Keith said, man, we left there three and a half hours later. We had a fucking song. We knew what it already was. All we had to do is refine it, you know, but it was already like telling us this is good. So. How's you know, Claudner doing a, now? You ever hear from John Claudner? Where, what's he, where's uh, he living? he's retired i haven't I, I unfortunately haven't talked to him in a while i think the last time i talked to him i saw him in maui believe it or not 
Yeah, he came to rock camp. He delivered a great master class. And That's uh, great. he's so good. He's just he's a so, he's, he's a brilliant. He's really helped out so many people in this yeah. in this, you know, from countless artists, you know, that he just believed in them, you know, what they do and just a fantastic guy. And not only just artists, but like guys like me that could help his artists. So at the end of the day, he was helping out his artists. I came in and helped out with a song that got them on American Music Awards and got, got a Grammy nomination. You know, it's all it all it's all right. for the artists with John. That yeah. was his job. A yeah. and R. That's it. Thank you so much. Okay, yep. Britt. All right, um, we've got another question. Um, the movie's still crazy. Uh, is there a story behind it? What's the story with that? That's the that's the song. The still crazy movie is the song. I I actually I got to go to the Golden Globes for the song for one of the songs. I had four songs in that movie, and I wrote them all with Mick Jones. And we didn't even write the lyrics. They sent us lyrics. It was one of those where you say, "How do you write a song?" They sent lyrics. It was tough. That's not my thing. But uh, this guy by the name of Chris Difford wrote the lyrics. He was in this band called Squeeze. And uh, we had these lyrics and we were laughing, man. I was like playing Thin Lizzy riffs and trying to write a song. And, you know, we're laughing and doing it. I go, dude, we're having way too much fun because we didn't have to write lyrics. That's what bogs you down. So we, I go, this is way too much fun, man. This is like, watch what happens. We're going to love this shit and we're going to be winning awards for this stuff because it's, it's way, it's being too easy. And it's exactly what happened. We went to the golden globes for a song we wrote in that movie. Uh, we didn't win, but we, we did get an Ivor Novello award, which is like a, a considered a Grammy award in Europe. So we both ended up with one of those for best song in a motion picture from still crazy flame still burns. That's amazing. Yeah, let's see. Amy is saying, Still Crazy was a movie that made 10-year-old me love rock and roll even more. I got the flame still burns tattooed on my chest. And the no text about glory looked like the flame still burnt. Uh, bums. Looks like the flame still bums. Thanks for that. <laughs> that's, that's cool. <laughs> All right. I'm going to turn it over to Karen St. Clair. Hi, Karen. Where are you calling from? Los Angeles area. All right. right. Thank you, David. Oh, he's not here now. And Britt, appreciate it. Hi, Marty. Hi. Thanks for career. Talking about Thin Lizzy, I work with Marco Mendoza. If you ever want to check out Vamplified, we got a song called Wildest Dream that's very Thin Lizzy oriented. Anyhow, um, I love the song Jaded. I love the song that you did, uh, Dreamer with Ozzy. I could go on and on and on. But um, I'm a Darkest Goth girl over at Darkest Goth Magazine at darkestgoth.com. And every month they have me put on a scary movie night. I just did Dark Shadows with Alice Cooper and uh, Johnny Depp. Hey, Chuck, how you doing? I worked with Chuck uh, on stage one day in Minneapolis for the Raise the Dead tour. I won the VIP thing. And so this month I'm doing... Um, We've already shot it. I'm doing Memoirs of a Madman. That's got your uh, song on it. Beautiful, beautiful video, uh, Dreamer. Um, and uh, we've already shot it. I'm just waiting for the guy to edit it. So check it out, darkscott.com. I know Aerosmith right now is Music Care's Person of the Year. And I put together a bunch of recipes that tie into hook lines of songs. And I've given out a lot of sample copies. Alice has got one. Um, Glenn Sobel has one. Ozzy Osbourne has a copy. I ended up, uh, so does Zach Wilde. Ozzy, and so does Marco Mendoza, We're talking about Thin Lizzy. Um, I was working on it, and all of a sudden, I was talking to a concert promoter for Ozzy, and he asked me to do one for the Ozfest. So I ended up doing another. 76 of those. I ended up with 350 for the one that I had told Music Cares that they can have, basically. If they want to take this book, they can have the royalties for it. And then I was thinking, well, what else could we do for the music industry with this book? And 350 artists is 700 pages, because each mm -hmm. artist has two pages. Um, like this one right now, I'll just give you an example. This is Draw the Line. Aerosmith has two. 
and it's got um it's called snickerdoodles and i've got the aerosmith rocks i made like it's a little mag Oops. that's really cool and then it's got a snowman and over here is the recipe and it's got some of his uh, words in it, and it's got some other stuff. It's got round and round in it, and it's got some other things. That's but, cool. Wait, do you have a question for um? For yeah, I do. Um, I was thinking that it's time to start getting this out, you know, to the industry, to music cares, and I'm thinking that we could also get some royalties if we did like some boxes for the musicians. Those uh, what do they call them? Hello Fresh put an album in, you know, and deliver the recipes with the food and everything. And then the musicians get some royalties and that way it's win-win for everyone. And if anybody wants the opportunity, I've only given out sample copies to people of the whole entire thing. I'm ready to release it. Talk to Britt and tell her and I'll have her get back with me. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I'm ready to get this done. And I know Music Cares has went through a lot this year giving out money from touring artists that have lost from the COVID thing. So I think it's a really good time to get it started and talking to you has been an honor. And so just keep that in the back of your mind. Yeah, you're doing, you're, you're doing a great thing, man. That's awesome. We got to get it out there. Yeah. You know? yeah. Very cool. Thank you, Karen. All right. I'm going to turn it to uh, Rache. Rache, I'm probably saying her name Rache. wrong. No, you got it right. Okay. Um, I have uh, kind of a two-part question. Number one, as far as uh, publishing splits, when, you, when you're going into a session as a gun for hire, uh, do you typically have a set publishing split worked out beforehand, or do you work that out after the songs are done? You know, uh, uh, I've done this. Uh, that's a great question because I've worked with bands where they're smaller band, baby bands. You're going, man, they, wanna, they want me to write with four guys because there's four guys in the band. I'm like, I... I that's that's a tough ride in the first place. Just have right. four guys in the room plus you. So what I'll do in that situation, I'll just say, listen, you guys be the band, and I'll be Marty, and I'll do a fifty-fifty song with you, whether you, I, we work on your song or not. And I've done that, and it's worked, and I've I've had success doing that. I, I did that with this band called Sick Puppies. I got with the the guitar player, singer, and the bass player, and. That was the deal I made. I go, listen, I could get with one of you and just write this, you know, write a song and give it. But no, we got to have both. They're in. There. So I said, well, would you do this? And they agreed. So I did it. Okay. And that worked. I think you could, there's, you could work. If you're going to do that kind of thing, you mm -hmm. should work it out at the beginning. Because for the most part, when you get into a room with someone, you're looking at, if there's two people in there and you're the third, you're looking at splitting it three ways. That's kind of right. like the the going way it is but you know i would suggest a, a guy like you know or wants to be a guy like me going in with a band and you're just you know you could do it if you're producing a record or so you could anything could be worked out it's like you could take five percent it doesn't matter it just it depends you know but i think uh for a guy like me being a songwriter and a producer I, I i think it's a cool thing that i'm not holding back sometimes you know i've believe me i've produced stuff and i didn't write it or anything and i i bite my tongue sometimes going man if they would just say this you know and and i've done it i i did it with mick jagger i changed this whole part of a song on his and i didn't get a writer credit on it but you know mick jagger he's like he didn't offer it and i yeah. it was fine it wasn't it was just a th it was a small little thing it wasn't nothing major you know but definitely sort out that kind of deal if you're if you can get it out of the way and get if it. You're, yeah. If you're thinking, you know, if you're thinking something different, cause you know, there's these pop songs that they'll pass to this guy, this guy, and there's 15 writers and it's like, Hey man, you end up with 3% and they don't split it equal. They'll say, well, you only came up with that line, you know, right. they figure out well, how much is they used in the song. Yeah. That's it's, what I was, on, I was trying to figure out is because sometimes you say, Oh, well, you only wrote two words. So here's a 1% of the, and you'll, and they'll try, man, you yeah. know, and you, and, that's how it is with that music. It's tough, you know. Okay, and uh, one more question while I have you. Um, when you're when you're writing with somebody like an Aerosmith or an Ozzy, and I guess you're pretty established at this point, but at any point, do you have to put the fan, take the fan out of the room, and let the writer into the room? And how hard is that to become a peer with people you've looked? And 
this and that's the hard that was the hardest part when i got in with errol smith though you know i'm such a fan like wait a minute i'm like i'm in the room with these wax figure guys you know like i'm you know you know him so well and I was, it goes back to a guy like Kalodner and his advice is, listen, man, you're going to be overwhelmed. You're going to be in there with these guys that they, they just, they do what they do. And it sounds cool. It may not, it, it, but it might not be good enough for the aerospace record that I need to sell. So you're going to have to get past that fact of who they are and what they do and just get in there and do what you do. And that's why I, I called you. So you would do that. And I'm giving you this advice. If you don't do what you do, you will not get anything. And that was his advice. So I took it all the way with that. I said, I stood up for parts. I stood up with them, even Ooh. never working with them. And I'm like, this was like my biggest break, you know. But I stood up. And I was like, man, I don't know. I would go here and say, what if you did this? And and it worked. Yeah. Awesome. So, so thank, you. thank you again, Kaladner, you know. Yeah. Appreciate it. Amazing. Well, Marty, this has been so informative and so um, interesting. And uh, we can't thank you enough for taking the time to spend your evening with us here tonight. And thank you for everybody that participated. Uh, and thank you, John Greenberg, as well. Um, yeah, I think we all learned a lot. Um, you got to do this again. You're, you're amazing. Love your stories. Uh, it's motivating, inspirational. So uh, thank you so much for being here. Hey guys, thank you all for being here. This has been a pleasure, uh, you know, and great to see my my old friends here. That now it reminds me, John. We'll we'll talk and we'll we'll start collaborating like this and and keep it, you know, do what we can. This is kind of the the future right now, you know. But uh, thank you again. Yeah, sure is. Yes, thank you so much. And guys, like I said, check out our other classes at rockcamp.com. Um, like I mentioned, we've got uh, some cool guitar classes and producer classes. Um, and hopefully we'll do more songwriting classes. More with you, Marty, because this is awesome. We could do a part two to this. Um, so thank you guys so much. Uh, and be safe, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Right thank you, man. Have a good one, guys. Thank you. you want to show me the outtakes? Oh, yeah. 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 Your daddy wants to do me in. Sniffing. When the sun never shines. Black cherry. No mama. Kink. Sweet Loretta. Is anybody out there? Yeah, we're good. Ah! Daddy wants to do your me daddy, in. Yeah, your mom wants to do me <laughs> Daddy wants to do me in. The heat of love. Ooh. I have spies in There's nothing like the internet, huh? Yeah. You want to show me the outtakes? Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.